I'm a little late to this topic because I've been at Champions, but let's talk the 2024 calendar. That It was released by Riot. They went into a bit of detail about it, though not the most detail in the world. And I think it deserves a bit of a breakdown. So let's have a look, shall we? Uh, I'm going to bring up you know, some of this video, which was them announcing the 2024 Valorant Champions Tour and kind of just walk through some of it with you guys. So this is their plan for 2024. Obviously, these teams are going to ascend. Pepe laughed. This is from a while ago. And obviously, at this point, you've already seen my video about the guard. But, you know, <laughs> in theory, there are 11 teams per region for the 2024 season. So let's start there. That's an awful number. Do you guys remember any tournaments from other games that have 11 teams in them? No, because nobody wants to work with these awful numbers. It's a prime number. It doesn't divide very well into like separate groups. You can't run three groups of four, for example. A round robin would just be even longer than it was last time. So basically, it's a shite number of teams to work with if you're looking at a format, right? So that's important to keep in mind. So bear that in the back of your head while we're talking through this, because this is probably going to be one of the most uh, difficult seasons to come up with good formats for when you're talking about the regular season of stuff. Uh, and, you know, later on down the line, once we add certain amounts of uh, challengers teams in the future too, uh, you know, we're going to run into these kind of issues again. Uh, but speaking about challengers, uh, they have extended challengers to being all year round, which is a fantastic change. Uh, this is partly what this, the people in the community were clamoring for. This adjustment to have, uh, let me just move my webcam a little bit. I might have to just move this around the screen during the video. Uh, the the adjustment to have, you know, stuff happening in the off-season so that your year doesn't just end as soon as Ascension's over. Or frankly, if you don't make Ascension, like way earlier than that during July. Um, it's different if you're Tier 1 and you're still under contract, but Tier 2 teams, they're just going to bail, they're going to drop out, you know, the orgs are not even going to exist within the scene. So this, a very needed change, I think. And it's going to add some interesting stuff. First of all, Challenges is going to be after Ascension, uh, sorry, sorry. Ascension is going to be after Champions, which I think is a fantastic change. Again, it gives Ascension its own spot. Don't know about you, but I would have loved to be able to watch more of Ascension this year. And I just couldn't because it was overlapping with all sorts of other things. It was in the run-up to major tournaments. There was like, I think it was when LCQ was going on or sometime around that kind of time. Uh, so I just didn't get to really watch it as much as I would have liked to. Um, but it does also mean that the 2025 season starts, judging by this, in October of 2024, which brings up its own unusual, uh, not problems, but just quirks, I suppose. Uh, there isn't really an off-season to change your roster. You know, Ascension finishes. If you didn't win, then there's barely any time to get going again before the next season starts. Uh, maybe that first beginning part is going to be open qualifiers or something like that, so you won't actually have to participate as a team that lost Ascension. But there's still going to be, you know, like, you're lacking that large gap for teams to really figure out what they want to do heading into the next year. Um, I think you have to be flexible during this period of time because T1 players are not going to know whether or not they're participating in the year after. Um, so you don't really know whether they're available for Tier 2. And some of the Tier 2 players are definitely going to get poached during this period of time because it overlaps with the main off-season where teams are going to be looking to uh, improve their Tier 1 rosters. So I, I would imagine, and I hope that this is the case, that this beginning of the 2025 season should be weighted less and be more of like a trial period. You know how like they had the points to get into uh, stuff like Ascension? Uh, probably just less points, basically, right? And it's a bit more of a trial period that still accounts for some really good uh, practice and kind of trialing some rosters around, moving people up and down between Tier 1 and Tier 2. So pretty sick. There's also a loan system in place. So presumably... Although I don't think it's been announced, um, that means there's no six-player requirements for the league anymore. We saw a lot of teams kind of struggling with that system. Uh, some not, you know, just basically putting their coach in the spot and making the entire rule fairly useless. Some others having to use vast amounts of, uh, you know, emergency subs and that kind of thing. But... Uh, this ruling should help address both of those issues that we were facing. And uh, basically, it means that the players in Tier 2 can be moved up to play in Tier 1. And then I would assume that there's going to be some very rigorous protections in place in order to uh, make sure that partner teams can't just send their top players down to Smurf in Tier 2. If their season's over or if they're in a gap, you know, if they don't make it to Madrid or Shanghai or something, they can't just send their players down to Smurf in Tier 2. There's got to be some protections around that. We don't know the details at the moment, but those are so obvious that I would hope uh, that there's protections in place to that degree. You know, classic protections would be something like, if you play this week in Tier 1, you can't play for 
you know x amount of time before you drop back down to tier two something like that um certainly you can't play the same week but usually there'd be some kind of like knock-on period as well um or if you play more than half the year in tier one you can't play at all in tier two something like that you know what i mean um the, these protections are fairly standard actually with systems that work like this so i would assume right are going to get them uh fairly correct uh they've also got changes for premiere which is interesting i didn't realize that they were going to structure premiere this kind of heavily i suppose i've paused at a bit of a weird time there but there's a red overlay but you can you, you can still see things so um the yeah you've got end of april you've got some promotions end of august you've got promotions as well these are promotions directly into challenger it's a sick system a lot of games have been trying to implement something like this and none of them have really been able to do it anywhere near as well as i've seen riot attempt it with valorant it looks like a great system um so a lot of people have concerns with stuff like smurfing for example or uh you know stuff like that but to be honest when you think about this this is going to be the top level of premiere like where the essentially it's going to be the next thing underneath playing challenges so this is going to be highly competitive how could you even smurf in this you could smurf in it if you were a pro player or if you're a challenges player right but i think it's very easy to put protections there right you're not going to find smurfs from those guys because they're risking their entire careers if they get caught so that's just a that's already inherent in there it's not the same there's going to be much more stringent punishments i would imagine um if you were caught as a pro trying to boost some level of premier team i would imagine that that would have major consequences for your career and i think it should do um and that would immediately knock that kind of shit on the head so uh i don't think you, that you'll see any kind of issues with that but it does also imply that we're not really going to see those pro kind of pug teams playing in premiere which i know a lot of people really enjoyed i mean your content creator teams can still definitely play but if you're affiliated with a currently existing challengers team or a um or a uh, a professional team as well one of the partnership teams then i would imagine you just won't be allowed to play in premiere because if it directly qualifies you into challenges that would introduce you know a whole wave of problems like what for example happens if the cloud nine pug team wins division 20 and gets promoted into challenges i would assume that's not going to be allowed therefore you avoid the entire issue um I think it's also just interesting to note what happens here with the slot like who owns the slot into challengers is there some kind of roster rule like the three out of five must be the same as you know the your starting roster um during when you won premiere um is there some kind of way in which like the team captain controls the spot or are you supposed to build some kind of like org identity like an llc that holds the spot or something i would imagine it's going to be the roster just three-fifths of the roster does seem to be like a pretty classic rule extending from cs but this is the only area in valorant where that would exist obviously everywhere else is the organization that holds the spot and it's very deliberately done like that so you know if the roster holds the spot going from premiere to challengers but then they get bought out by an organization and then if they win ascension the org controls the spot at what point does the ownership of the spot switch hands i'd be interested to know that and i'd be interested to see how riot deals with that because i actually think that that's a pretty uh tricky situation to handle and one which doesn't immediately present itself with an obvious solution um but yeah just something uh to note as another issue that basically riot has to deal with in terms of them being the developer and tournament organizer that runs the entire thing so if we skip things forward here a little bit where is this all right so this is the calendar they're bringing back a points based system and i think that's absolutely necessary so before we talk about the calendar let's talk about the point based system this is how the circuit used to work before i don't know last year a couple of years ago something like that um and i think it's really necessary in the calendar that they're proposing because otherwise what we've done this year is directly qualify people that won tokyo to champions uh sorry directly qualify the people that made it to tokyo to champions it's a shit system okay i think that we it worked for this year because we weren't playing in enough splits but it's not a good system for the future you don't want the same teams to always be qualified for masters and champions yes you want some level of consistency between the events so that teams so that uh 
the fans can get hooked into storylines but you don't always just want the same teams turning up all the time just because they were good earlier on in the year you want their performance later on to also have some impact um all right so let's talk about the calendar they've got a two-week double limb kickoff tournament happening during february that sounds like a sick idea for a tournament to start things off with i thought we were going to be getting a split that was originally what they said i believe that would be replacing like this area of the calendar the lock-in was in during 2023 uh but they've shifted things around a bit so they're doing a kickoff tournament i like the idea of that i think it's a cool way to begin i also think that you know you want your points to not be particularly high here it's when people are just coming with their fresh rosters everyone will be shuffling things around during the off season so the teams won't be as amazing to start with we obviously saw massive discrepancies between the teams that were very good at lock-in and the teams that were very good at champions uh, even the teams that were very good by the time tokyo rolled around so i, I like the idea of waiting this less and having a bit of a one-off format here um and it looks like there isn't exactly enough time to be able to do the full split i assume in later years things are going to start in january but this year with them onboarding all of the chinese partnership teams which they've announced uh that process has got to take a long time you know how long it took when it came to uh, the the other teams from uh emea pacific and americas uh, so adding another whole 10 organizations and having to do due li- diligence on those teams is gonna be tough um especially when the game's only just released there so yeah uh, i can understand why we're beginning the season in february rather than january this year uh, at least that's my speculation then we go into this masters event which is held in madrid looks like a sick place to run an event although we might not have any spanish teams there unfortunately because they're kind of wank at the moment uh, although actually giants are pretty good um but presumably uh yeah so th- this this tournament is happening with only eight teams so that's the big headline for this one and is that great i i don't think so but clearly they have a goal in mind right as you go on this tournament has eight teams shanghai has 12 teams champions has 16 teams so it's increasing by four every time and they're clearly trying to scale things bigger and bigger as you head later on in the year as teams start to get better as you start to get a better idea of where you sit in the league um and as the points build up to get closer to champions you want to add a bit of recency bias there as well i think just so that you make sure you have good teams who are actually in form for champs um it's less of a spectacle though for the fans having only eight teams there and also with eight and 12 for the two masters events i think we're starting to get to a point maybe not just yet we'll have to wait and see how it feels during 2024 but i'm a little concerned that i don't want to put all the weight on champions champions is great and it obviously is the most prestigious tournament of the year but champions already has increased production level it has increased prestige it has a bigger prize pool it has the the skins that you get for making it into champions that contribute massively to the digital goods revenue of the teams so there's already tons of reasons to care more about champs and if you tone down the masters too heavily instead of bringing champions even further up i think you'll just end up with the league of legends effect and the dota 2 effect for example where nobody gives a shit about any tournaments that aren't worlds or ti and i don't i don't like that i don't think that's where we should be i don't think as an esport that has come very closely out of the shadow of counter-strike we should be trying to go to a one tournament matters per year format compared to a like i I don't even know how many counter-strike has uh, or had at its most busy portion but you know 10 or something uh actually it's probably more like 15 or 20 um, I think it's good to still try to keep the feel of the majors, of having multiple tournaments a year where, for example, from this year, Fnatic is still probably going to be considered the best team of the year, despite the fact that EG made the finals of Tokyo and won champions. You can weigh these things up. You can have more of a nuanced understanding of teams' dips, peaks, and troughs in of form and how the metas and the variance of the game itself has impacted certain teams' runs. So I like a more balanced system personally we'll have to wait and see how this feels during 2024 so let's carry on uh taking a look at their uh they're talking about madrid all right so here's the here's the overall schedule then so you have these international stages stage one and stage two either side of shanghai and this is where a lot of people are having concerns because this is only like five weeks right 
four weeks, five weeks, something like that, either side of Shanghai. And that would be extraordinarily condensed if you were trying to do the same format as this year, the round robin, especially considering that with 11 teams, that means one extra game per team of, uh, of, of round robin. So that's a lot more matches. Not, not like doubling it, but it's a lot more matches and way less time. So I think there's either three options here, realistically. I think either we're playing two matches per week, which I don't think would be the greatest option. I don't think that's a good thing for the teams. I think that'll introduce large levels of burnout, and I hope that they don't go in that direction. Or it means that you have a brand new format, but trying to come up with a brand new format for 11 teams sounds shit. You know, you might be able to cook up some kind of Swiss system, um, but anything that's like separating into groups is just awful with 11 teams. So they could try and tie themselves in loops coming up with a good system, but I don't think that would be the best idea. Or you could play one round robin tournament and split it between two stages. And, you know, if you look at the length of the stage during 2023 and the length of stage one and two combined during 2024, um, that could definitely be a reasonable proposal, I think. Uh, so that would then make the break during Shanghai quite a nice bit of a reset, bit of downtime for the teams that don't make it. Of course, teams that are at the top are always going to have to just be on the grind almost full time. But that's kind of how you want to design a system. I know the teams at the top are always going to complain about that. But I find myself sympathizing with, you know, what Leo and the rest of Riot say there, which is essentially you want to design systems where the better teams are playing more often. And I do think that they should extend the year overall uh, and push champions later so that they can ha add breaks during the season. I'll talk about that in a bit. But in general, the better teams are just going to play more and the worst teams are going to be able to take breaks because they don't make it to the Masters events or Champs events. Now, the other massive thing that's missing here is LCQ. There's no LCQ at all. And I am so torn about this. I really am. I think... I like LCQ. Uh, and that might seem like a really weird sentence to say, but I I like the event because it gives teams still a great shot at making it to champions at the end of the year, at recovering their season, at pulling off some kind of miracle run. And it's only one team makes it. It's very cutthroat. I think it makes for a great tournament. It's also an excellent logistical tool to make sure that teams don't end their season too early on. You know, the, the season isn't just dead by the time you get to like, uh, you know, depending on what the format actually is, uh, maybe it could be dead like right before Shanghai in like April, which would be a travesty. Or maybe it would be dead halfway through stage two uh, if you don't make it to some playoffs that would be at the end or something. Uh, and then it's dead in like June. So... It does help in that sense of making sure that teams don't just give up and have nothing to play for for five months out of the year. Um, although it only really adds an extra month. But anyway, w what are the downsides of it? The downsides are the LCQ teams like bombed out of champions. Despite their miracle runs, despite the um, Norton 9 team of crew making it on a run, crew didn't win a game. Zeta didn't win a game. Giants did actually look fairly good and to be honest Navi didn't look that bad either but neither of them made it out of the group stage and only one of them uh actually did giants win a game do I'm, I'm gonna fact check myself live actually because i can't remember whoopsie daisy let's have a look did giants win a game i can't even recall uh yes they beat crew of course they did there was two lcq teams in the same group so one of them was guaranteed to get a win here and then you have uh, Zeta bombing out and uh, Na'Vi won a game, obviously, over Liquid and then uh, ended up losing out, but in close matches and definitely could have made it to the playoffs. But anyway, all of that, a very long-winded way of saying the LCQ teams were pretty shit. And there isn't really a benefit to having shit teams involved in the league, um, especially if they just go on a run of form and they can't repeat that once they get to champions. Um, so I think it's a very mixed bag of a tournament and... Maybe people will be clamoring to have it back, but I'm unsure how I feel about it. Let me know how you feel about it in the comments, to be honest, because I think both opinions are pretty valid, frankly. Now, with them going to a points-based system, though, 
the points themselves become extremely important. If you lost everything during the kickoff tournament, which would just be two matches because it's double elimination, and then you've lost everything during stage one, and remember, we don't know what the format is there, so it could be could be anything from a couple of games if they had a brand new format to, you know, like uh, 10 games if it was a true round robin, although I, I hope they don't go in that direction. Um, so then either your year is finished in like April or May, which would be terrible, or you still need to have enough points available from stage two to be able to recover the entire season and promote yourself to champions. So that's another thing to keep in mind here, because if you if you have, you know, some, some whatever your format is for stage two, it kind of has to give you enough chances to recover a terrible season. Like maybe, maybe you don't want teams who have literally bombed out, like gone zero and whatever. If they haven't won a match until April, maybe it is fair that their season's over. But if they've won a couple and they're just hanging around towards the bottom, you probably still want enough points available so that throughout stage two, if they won every game and made it to playoffs and popped the fuck off in playoffs, they could still make a run to champions, right? Almost like a mini LCQ, or like a, a major LCQ, actually, because it would be significantly longer and you know more thorough than just a, a knockout tournament. But I think that's going to make the point system extremely important and we don't have any information about that yet so i'll probably do another video just breaking down the points and how it would work and simulating a couple of ideas once those eventually get released um in terms of the calendar overall though there is still an issue i think some might say at least with most of the teams 24 out of 40 of the teams that are going to be in the 2024 season their season is going to end during july before Champions begins, 24 out of 40 of the teams are going to be done. But with 4 out of 10 of the... Sorry, 4 out of 11 of the teams making it to Champions, with Champions being a 16-team tournament, uh, that's, that's really not that bad. 16 out of 40 get to keep playing, and those are the 16, in theory, best teams that you have continuing during Champions. So if you are still quite a decent team, if you're in like the, you know... Uh, more than the top third, what is that, the top like 40% or something, then you, you still get to play, your season uh, continues. I would like to see them go for a smaller off-season. I'll wait until they expand this graphic just a little bit. Oh, they, they messed it up. All right, oh, done it again. All right, so what I'd like to see them do is, I would like to see them in 2025, I understand why this might not be possible in 2024 because of the Chinese teams being added, but I'd like to see them begin the season in January, mid-January, something like that, maybe even the second week, and I suppose that is mid-January. So start it in January and end it instead of towards the end of August, towards the end of September. Now what that does for you is, you get an extra eight weeks on the calendar. You get those extra four weeks of January and the extra four weeks of September. So that's eight extra weeks of rest weeks. I wouldn't add any more matches. All I would do is pull the events apart a little bit and insert a few weeks break in between some of the most intense events. And most of that break I would have coming out the back of Masters tournaments to allow for those top teams that go to all of the events to still have time to reset, still have time to rework their map pool, rework their, you know, compositions, whatever they need to do, rework their strat book. And that would leave your off-season being the whole of October, November, and December. And you would have Ascension running in that time, you would have Game Changers running in that time, you'd have your off-season events running in that time, and if the players just want to take a break, that's three months, that's a quarter of the year that they still get to have a break. So I think that would be a much better system rather than having a four months off, off season or even a five months off season when you consider that we've been starting in February. Uh, so I think that would be a much improved system to run with. Uh, one of the reasons that they, that the community speculates at least, I don't think I've ever heard Riot come out and say this, though they might have done, is that the, the kind of consensus on this is they don't want champions overlapping with worlds. And that makes sense, but not for the reason you might think. I think it makes sense primarily because when I work on these big global events, when I work on champions, I get to speak to the staff involved. And a lot of those staff work on 
the League of Legends events as well. A lot of the staff work on Worlds. And these enormous events take huge amounts of prep work. And the Global Riot people are required for both of them. And it's not just in terms of them turning up. There's also a lot of work that goes in prior to the event kicking off where they've got to be planning things and working out the logistics and sorting out all of the you know production and everything that goes in, into all of this. Setting up the stage, designing it, making sure that it, it works, paying for it shipping all the people over you know there, there is a vast vast amount that goes into making these big events happen and at the moment as far as i'm aware uh they don't have purely dedicated teams for valorant and league they overlap they and that's also a good thing you wouldn't necessarily want them to be purely dedicated uh, valorant has benefited a lot from having the experience of people that have worked in league of legends and seen how these top shows can be pulled off and come into Valorant as well with all of that experience and and helpful knowledge. So the overlap is not the 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 reason why I would speculate they don't want it to overlap is not just due to viewership. In fact, I would argue that's probably a minor concern compared to the vast amounts of extra cost and probably lower product you would get by trying to uh, not use the same people. So. Those are most of my thoughts on the 2024 season. Like I said, I'll probably put out another video as well when we know more about the points because a lot of how this season operates is going to come down to that. The points and the format for the regular season. Uh, overall, though, I like the way that this is heading. I know it looks more condensed and more frantic even than 2023, but I think part of that is probably because the Chinese teams are coming on, and so they couldn't start in January. And I think that will be alleviated a little bit uh, heading into the future when we, you know, we're never going to have to onboard 10 extra teams from uh, plus the Ascension teams again. So this overall calendar, I think the addition of Valorant Challengers extending further, the swapping of Ascension after Champions, um, the scaling upward of the importance and prestige of the events is quite cool, although I have some concerns. Hopefully in the future they start it towards January and end a little later in the year, spread things out a bit, and also Premier seems like a dope system, but they have a serious uh, issue, I think, that they need to solve in terms of who uh, the ownership of the spot that you have in Challengers and when that passes from players to org. Uh, but that's it from me. I'll catch you next time, probably with one of those videos I mentioned.